everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Emily Manning, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host a discussion on the law and economics of net neutrality. Our moderator today is Lawrence J. Spywack, President of the Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies, and we're also joined by Dr. George S. Ford, Chief Economist at the Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies. If you'd like to learn more about today's speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federal Society. With that, thank you for joining us today, and Larry, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emily. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Larry Spivak. As Emily said, I'm the president of the Phoenix Center. Uh, I also serve on the Fed Sox Communications uh, Executive Committee, and I also serve on the Antitrust Committee, so I'm very active with the Fed Sox. Uh, and with me is uh, the Phoenix Center's Chief Economist, uh, Dr. George Ford. As you can imagine, as I'm the lawyer and I don't do math, I'll be handling the law, and George will be handling the economics. Um, we're very lucky to have George um, talk about this issue. George was actually the central citation in the FCC's Restoring Internet Freedom Order. And so what we are doing today, just for those of you who are unfamiliar with net neutrality, um, net neutrality has been going on in one form or another for about 20 years. Uh, we actually looked on our webpage and we, we discovered that the first net neutrality paper we did was around 2003. So uh, net neutrality has managed to pay for our kids' college and uh, probably will go right through our retirement and then the next generation will come up underneath us. So recently, the reason why we're now talking about it again, uh, well, at the beginning of the Biden administration, it was very clear that the Biden administration, they, did, they said this in their executive order on competition, that they wanted to reinstate uh, Title II common carrier regulation for the internet. Uh, it got delayed quite a bit uh, because they could not get a third FCC commissioner in place, uh, but they recently did a few months ago, Commissioner Anna Gomez, and now the FCC is rushing to accomplish the entire regulatory agenda uh, pretty much as fast as they can to beat the Congressional uh, Review Act deadline, which will probably come sometime in the spring. So to this end, and this was again, no surprise, uh, about a month or two ago, the FCC released again, a notice of proposed rulemaking to reinstate common carrier regulation on the internet. Um, so what we're going to do, and the purpose of this is sort of uh, twofold, uh, I'm going to start uh, by going through sort of the sordid history of net neutrality and how the law has evolved over the last 20 years or so. And I think that's a very important as people sort of think about this. Um, after that, what hasn't changed is the economics of this business. And then George will talk about uh, sort of the economics of the problem and how the FCC is thinking about it correctly or incorrectly. And I'll leave that up to George. So um, before I begin, I will say this. For those of you all who want to follow along at home, uh, George and I have probably written more on this than most. And I guess about a month ago, I wrote a piece for the Federalist Society blog um, called the FCC Returns to the Law and Economics Free Zone, where I put hyperlinks to a lot of our research in there. So a lot of what we're talking about today um, is discussed in that blog, but there are links if you want that. And then George is also going to be talking about a new paper, which we, we released this morning, which updates um, a lot of the investment effects, uh, which is called uh, Investment in the Virtuous Circle Theory and Empirics, that is available on our webpage, uh, www.phoenix-center.org. Uh, and if you also go on our webpage and look at the net neutrality section of that, you'll find all of these papers and law reviews, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk about the law first. 
Um, now, full disclosure, um, net neutrality given is sort of an idea, but when you put that into practice, it it's a very complicated issue and raises a, a, a just a myriad of, of issues that come up. Rate making, forbearance, preemption, poll attachments, privacy, just a whole host of stuff. Um, as we don't have time during this uh, th this teleform to dive into every single issue, I'm going to try to keep it at sort of the academic level and highlight what I think are the primary issues that folks should be thinking about um, as the as this iteration of the uh, of the fight sort of goes on. So let's start with the Communications Act itself. Um, for better or for worse, when it comes to deregulation, the, the Communications Act is, a, is, is, is what I would describe as binary. Um, there is, for all intents and purposes, there's Title II, which deals with common carrier telecommunication services. Now, there is forbearance under Title II, but that's uh, that comes under Section 10 of the Communications Act, and that is a very detailed uh, statutory criteria that you have to satisfy. And of course, uh, what one commission can forbear from, the next can unforbear from. The other is this notion of an information service under Title I of the Communications Act. So let's go back in time to um and they are essentially unregulated and, and title an information service if you i date myself you know was originally things like what do you do about voicemail is that a is that a telecommunication service oh, of course not um but again let me let me step back so let's go back in time sort of the early 2000s where this fight and this discussion of title one versus title two came about in the early 2000s um, the 1996 Act's unbundling regime was still raging hot and heavy, but it was it was coming to an end, and you had things like the introduction of voice over internet protocol coming in. Now, if you were an information service, you didn't have to pay access charges under Title II. What's interesting, and, and I think then Chairman Michael Powell deserves a lot of credit for that, the FCC had always had a tradition of, in order to spur new entry and to encourage new technologies, is that they had a paradigm of they would sort of keep regulation of incumbents in place, but then they would reduce as much entry barriers as they could for new entrants, and that would then spur entry. And that was sort of the motivation behind the FCC's competitive carrier paradigm, which, which got long distance service going. And they tried to do that with the, the then burgeoning um, uh, broadband service, as well as for voice over internet protocol. So uh, what the decision was made back in the early 2000s, that they said, you know, we, we don't want to do the Title II route because it was perceived that the danger that they could flip flop. And they wanted to make a very clear statement that information services were not were never going to be touched by the legacy uh, common carrier regulations of Title II. So back the, the FCC started and this is what Michael Powell started was with was with the cable modem order, uh, which eventually went to the Supreme Court in a case called Brand X. Um, and the decision was, well, does the FCC have the authority to, reclassify service, which was telecommunications and information service. And there was a lot of bickering back and forth about um, whether actually the statutory definition met or was failed. But the long story short of this decision, which is the big takeaway from this, is that the Supreme Court said, look, the Communications Act is ambiguous. The FCC has the authority to interpret its statute under Chevron. Therefore, we will uphold the commission's decision to reclassify uh, then cable modem service 
uh, from a Title II service to a Title I service. And that decision, Brand X, sort of haunts us to this day because, um, and I'll get to this in a little bit, because we know the act is ambiguous. And so under Supreme Court precedent, you can change your mind so long as you articulate a legitimate policy reason for doing so. And that's probably why, among other reasons, we've had sort of this flip-flop. But nonetheless, the policy decision was made. They decided that cable modem was an information service. Shortly thereafter, the FCC then proceeded to issue independent orders uh, reclassifying uh, uh, broadband provided by wireline providers. They issued an order uh, saying that um, broadband provided by wireless providers was also an information service. And then finally, they actually even issued an order saying that internet provided by broadband power line providers is also an information service. Uh, that one didn't really take off, but there is an order for that. So we now have this unregulated environment where we're starting to get the investment in. Um, you know, they used to describe it, if I remember the phrase, it was like new rules, new wires, new rules, as opposed to legacy stuff. So we're starting to have that. And, and as, again, you're getting the beginning of VoIP coming in, you're beginning the beginning of the internet, um, I'm sure many of you remember getting internet service for those of us who can date ourselves, you know, first 256 kilobits, then maybe, you know, you got 756 kilobits. Oh my goodness, it was wonderful compared to what we have now, but understand the environment in which this came. But nonetheless, as the desire to deregulate, um, to, excuse me, the desire to regulate is often very powerful to overcome, you started to hear these anecdotes about, oh my goodness, uh, the the Bell operating companies, and again, I date myself with a very old term, or box, were engaging in these horrible conducts and, and we need rules to protect blocking. Well, what were these so-called incidences? One of them was a concert uh, that was broadcast by, I think it was AT&T and Eddie Vedder, the rock star said, um, F George Bush, and somebody pushed a button and censored him. Now, I remember George and I at the time thinking, probably at that time during the middle of the Gulf War, many people on the internet were screaming nasty things about President Bush. But because one guy in a truck pushed a button, somehow that was indication that we need to have massive government regulation. The other more, more prominent incident was uh, the barbershop quartet uh, BitTorrent incident. Um, BitTorrent used in the old days. BitTorrent was a a program that essentially it was a network. It, it everybody everybody on the computer network who had the program you sort of shared among them. But there was no traffic management involved. And somebody a guy liked to collect barbershop quartet songs said, "Gee, I'm being slowed down." Uh, and this was sort of the big thing that motivated, uh-oh, Com and Comcast had slowed it down. And this was evidence that we needed rules. What is interesting is a quick footnote to this, and this actually was at a symposium that George and I held many years ago. It turns out that the reason why the blocking occurred was that because Comcast paying customers, and I don't know if anybody remembers 18 t call Vantage, it was interfering with that because these systems, and I would commend everybody reading the Supreme Court's uh, decision in Grokster, there's a great footnote in there, talked about these, these open access uh, torrent sites that, that were very popular at the time. They had no idea. So you had this real traffic management problem that nobody could control. Um, and so back then the argument was, well, sort of build your way out of, build yourself out, build your way out of congestion was, was a popular argument back in the mid 2000s. But um, these, these anecdotes became very powerful and the, political, uh, and the political pressure started to build. The FCC's response was to come up with sort of a set of internet principles at the time, but they were just principles. But the pressure was mounting, the pressure was mounting. And so now we're about 2007 and sort of the waning days of the George Bush 
uh, presidency and the Democrats had seized control. And there was a big fear at the time that uh, much like the Cable Act of, of uh, 1992, that the Democrats were going to override a veto. So the commission decided it needed to do something to fit the politics. And so they brought a case against Comcast. And they said, well, you violated the principles of, uh, and that was the FCC's, I think, attempt to put a Band-Aid on C. The process works. We don't need legislation. Uh, Comcast then decided that it was going to challenge the FCC's uh, uh, order uh, that, that, they, that they, they ruled against them. And the D.C. Circuit agreed. Uh, again, oversimplifying, what the D.C. Circuit basically found was is that the commission had failed to make a an adequate case of ancillary jurisdiction that ties you back to a specific authority in in the communications act they didn't say that the fcc lacks ancillary authority they just said that the fcc did a very bad authority and there were also no decisions because how could you be guilty of something if there were no formal rules so that was the comcast case um nonetheless there was a change in political administration and uh, the, now we're into the first term of the Obama administration and the FCC's response was the 2010 open internet rules. Uh, now what is interesting about the 2010 open internet rules is that the FCC made a very deliberate decision not to go the Title II route. What they did was it, Section 706, which is essentially a reporting uh, statute and a sort of a, uh, a statement of policy that every American uh, should have access to advanced broadband, they decided that they would turn that into, they would transfer that statute from being hortatory, in other words, a sort of statement of policy, to actually an affirmative grant of authority. And what they did was they triggered that by doing in their broadband report is they said, well, broadband's not being deployed, quote, on a reasonable and timely basis. And we'll get to this a little bit, you know, define reasonable and define timely. But that was the trigger that they used. But still, nonetheless, they did not go the Title II route. Um, what is interesting about that particular case is that the entire industry, with the exception of one company, Verizon, had signed off on that deal. I think everybody could have lived with it. They, they supported it. They filed briefs in the DC circuit. But what happened was the DC circuit overturned those rules. Why did the DC circuit overturn those rules? Very simply, it looked at the no blocking rule and said, you know what? This is essentially common carrier regulation. This rule is you are requiring broadband service providers to provide traffic at a regulated price of zero. And what that means is, is that net neutrality is, at bottom, nothing else more than rate regulation. And the Communications Act clearly said that you cannot treat an information service like a common carrier service, the court remanded. So now we are back in a state of limbo. Um, and then now we're getting into the second term um, of, of the Obama administration where Tom Wheeler is uh, the chairman. So what happens now? There was a big fight over, could you do net neutrality rules without pulling the Title II trigger? And uh, I think I've got a link to the law review in there and I in, in, in the blog that Emily's got. But if you look at Comcast, if you looked at Verizon, and if you looked, there was another DC circuit case called Selco, which dealt with data roaming. The FCC probably could have fixed the 2010 rules, used a standard, something like commercially reasonable, and we probably would have never had to go down the Title II route. However, uh, the Obama administration wanted to go down the Title II route. There was a very famous blog or YouTube video, I can't remember at the time. And that was basically the green light from the White House and say, pull the Title II trigger. 
And so they decided they were going to reclassify after 15 years of deregulation and put legacy common carrier regulation back on the internet. But this is where things start to get interesting. Um, the problem that the FCC had, if you looked at the law at the time, um, particularly in, in, we're talking about the statute, Communications Act, plain language, and, and the 80 years of case law implementing Section 201, which deals with rate making, and Section 202, which deals with undue discrimination, the FCC couldn't do what it wanted to do, given the parameters of the law. They just couldn't do it. Uh, what they decided to do as a result is just engage in a huge amount of analytical gymnastics to get the order done. Um, it, it really was rather remarkable. Um, so what's interesting about that is that the FCC's own chief economist very famously said at the time, uh, the, the 2015 rules are, are a, an economics-free zone. That's not a very uh, ringing endorsement of what you're trying to do. Now, I would submit, and I wrote a very large law review with George about this, is that the order was actually also a legal free zone. What do I mean by that? We wrote a paper called Tariffing Internet Termination. The link is in the, the blog that Emily has. It's also on our webpage. Uh, was published in the Federal Communications Law Journal. And that is, if you were to take the FCC's own assumption, because what did the court in Verizon say? It is, net neutrality is explicitly rate regulation. And when you're talking about rate regulation, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution comes into play, right? Because you can't have what's called a confiscatory rate. That's a takings. Um, and if you have a no blocking rule that says you must take traffic at zero, and you know that the traffic imposes costs on your network, that is by definition a takings. So if you were to look at the way the FCC had teed up their argument, the correct and proper application of Title II would have, would have mandated any uh, uh, carriers having to file tariffs, could not have done it uh, with forbearance, at a positive price. That's how it would work. I mean, what's fascinating to me about, you know, they set a price of zero. Well, how'd you get a price of zero? Did you do a cost study? No. Did you set a rate making methodology? Telerik, Lyric? No. They just picked the price of zero. And that's a very important point about the rate making thing. And they, they didn't do that. So the order comes out and then it gets appealed in US Telecom. Here's the problem that happened in US Telecom. Um, and again, I would com commend everybody to read my law review, which was also referenced in the thing. So I also published in the Federal Communications Law Journal called U.S. Telecom and its Aftermath. Because the primary argument against the 2015 rules, they did, for whatever reason, people decided not to challenge the rules on basic rate making the Fifth Amendment. People stuck to their guns and made the argument going, oh, no, you know, we're back to the statutory definition. The court just shrugged that off given where it was in brand X. And I would submit in a case of extraordinary judicial deference, the, the, the DC circuit upheld all of the FCC's gymnastics, all of them, um, creating, as I say, Title II has absolutely no meaning right now. It ignored the rate making issues. It ignored the forbearance issues. It is It elevated section 706 above section 202. It is just replete with intellectual errors. Um, and the net result of that case, and I think this is a very important point to remember, the net result of that case is that that case stands for the proposition that the US government can regulate the rates, terms, and conditions of private firms without having to do the due process protections that a tariff would allow you of what, how, what did you, how'd you get the rate? Did you do a cost study? It's just, I will pick a price and you will do it. And you've seen now the precedent that that has caused and the mischief that has caused. I will give you two examples. Uh, after that case came out, Tom Wheeler tried to do a thing with special access. He just picked the price and said, you will do this. Again, how do you get to that price? I don't know, but they did it. NTIA currently to get bead funding 
as a middle income plan that's mandatory. Well, how did you get, are we doing any rate making? No, this has been a major destruction of, um, of, of legal norms that I think a lot of people are overlooking. And this is the law now is, is it just means what literally the old joke at the FCC is, what, what does it take to win? Three votes. And it is a, it is a great, in my view, a huge abuse of administrative power. Um, but the law is the law. And the, uh, the FCC certainly is very proud that the 2015 order, the current FCC is very proud that the two, 2015 order was, uh, was upheld. Uh, and I could go on, but again, it's it's a very long law review, and you can delve into the details if you're that interested. So we had that. And one other thing also just in the 2015 order at the time, um, some people had made an investment argument. They said, oh, this is going to reduce investment. You know, you can't do this. What the D.C. Circuit said in that case, in, 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 in U.S. Telecom said, look, we're kind of new. It's been a couple of months since the order, whatever it was. Um, the FCC has made predictive judgments. Uh, we're a court of law. We don't like looking at economics. It's math. We're lawyers. Uh, we will just defer to the FCC's predictive judgments. Okay, predictive judgments. Now let's flash forward to the next presidential administration, Trump administration, where the commission under Chairman uh, Ajit Pai said, wait a minute, we got to go back and reverse all this. The difference, though, I would submit between uh, Chairman Pai and Chairman Wheeler is that Chairman Pai respected economics. And he wrote an order and he relied in good part on Georgia's stuff and said, gee, the cost of, of reclassification clearly outweigh the benefits of, of, uh, of regulation. And so he issued the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Uh, that order raised a lot of issues dealing with poll attachments and uh, federal state relations, which I won't go into. Uh, but long story short, when that went up to the D.C. Circuit, going back to the Brand X case, uh, the D.C. Circuit upheld it, said, well, you know, you've articulated decent reason. Under Brand X, we, are, we, we have to do this. Now, what I find interesting, if you read the Mozilla case, is that I think, particularly with the benefit of time of a couple of years now, what it, what is interesting, and I was just rereading it the other day. Yes, they upheld the commission, but I would submit that they upheld the commission reluctantly. That, that decision, which was done per curiam, is just littered with little bombs and stuff. It's like, I really don't want to do it. I really don't want to give the commission the benefit of the doubt here, but Brand X governs. And it is just, and, and what's interesting, if you read the commission's new uh, NPRM, they actually cite Mozilla as if it upheld the commission's decision to do the 2015 rules. But that's kind of where the law is with this. So the law right now, um, it's a mess. Um, there's no doubt about it. I'm not sure what it means. And so, as I said a moment ago, the FCC just released its its new NPRM about a month or two ago. Um Again, no surprise they're going to do it. And the FCC seems to think, given that the law is a mess, that they are on firm legal grounds. And as I point out in my uh, blog for the FedSoc, they might have a point. They really might have a point. And the question is, is how do, if one is going to challenge those rules, what is going to do given the mess that the state of the law is in? Um, I think the most obvious for what I'm hearing from folks going around is that most people are going to put their eggs into the uh, major questions doctrine basket, which is a legitimate point. Um, I would commend, and I think Emily is going to put up a link. I did a phenomenal, uh, we, we, we did a phenomenal teleforum with uh, two former FCC general counsels, both parties, a former acting chair of the FTC and a former acting solicitor general to sort of talk about this, I would commend everybody to sort of look at that. Uh, the major questions doctrine after West Virginia EPA is basically, if it's a question of major economic and political importance, maybe that's best for Congress to decide. So the question is, is, is net neutrality or reimposition a question of major political and economic importance? I think the paper that George just did would sort of 
answer that question. Yes, but that is a whole other issue. And again, many people have written on the major questions doctrine. The Fed Sock has had many, many events on that. However, um, I'm not sure, uh, given one, one should not put all of their litigation eggs in the same basket. I do have a couple of other ideas, and I, I said those in my blog. You know, as you, as you've heard from the last uh, my last uh, uh, description of what I'm talking about, I still think if people want to take it up, the idea of Title II properly applied. Um, I'm really sort of shocked that nobody has made what to me is a rather obvious rate making argument, given what the D.C. Circuit said. You know, every time I hear the FCC saying it's not rate regulation, obviously they haven't read Verizon because they said explicitly rate regulation. That is a fertile ground. Um, and I would hope that people do that. Uh, another big issue, if you read the 2023 NPRM, is that they keep saying it's needed to do for public safety. Uh, and they always cite back to this uh, fire department, in, I think it's Santa Clara, where they had a residential plan and they got cut off in the middle of wildfires. But you know what's available now that wasn't available in 2015? FirstNet, which is actually the U.S. government's formal nationwide interoperable public safety network that issue should be off the table and the fcc doesn't even mention this in their in their in their order um there's that and then i think related to the public um to the major questions doctrine one could probably argue that the fcc's investment analysis in and of itself i mean what's amazing if you read the 2023 order and George will get into this in a moment. You know, notwithstanding that the that the that the that the, the Pi administration relied on peer review work, uh, the the current uh, uh, administration and leadership at the FCC has basically said, oh, "I don't believe it." Well, if you're not going to believe something that went through outside reviews and there's no other studies. And George will get into this. I don't know what to tell you. I think it's cognitive dissonance best, but that's where we're at. I think the other problem with that is, is that courts are slightly reluctant, uh, us, we being lawyers and doing math, the D.C. Circuit has routinely said that we do not sit as a referee in an economic, as of an economics journal. But I do think when you, when you have any lack of any support, um, that's still something to, to hit the court with. Uh, but we'll leave it with that. So... Uh, now that we're sort of talking about investment, I will leave that now to George to really take the deep dive into sort of all the the economics that the FCC's used over the years, what they've relied on and what they they haven't relied on. All right, thanks for that review, Larry. Brings back old memories. Done it. Yeah, been there, done that. Um, the investment question, uh, I guess, peaked out there with the um, the 2018 order, where that was sort of a pivot point uh, in the major argument for reclassifying uh, broadband as a Title I service. But that argument, investment argument, has been around for ages since since basically the very beginning of the dispute. Uh, the commission has never done anything serious uh, about studying that question. Uh, very few people have. Really, there's uh, some published work on it, some unpublished work on it, uh, almost all of it showing something happened, uh, either uh, always on the, the non-positive side of the equation. Uh, but instead, the commission uses just really silly arguments about investment, you know, demand's increasing, so investment's increasing, everything will be fine. Those kind of arguments ignore what would have happened if you hadn't regulated. Um, what is the counterfactual investment level, which is, is largely absent in almost all the discussion of investment effects of net neutrality or any other regulation, really, that the FCC is engaged in. Uh, the counterfactual idea is related to what would have happened if some policy was not in place and not just looking at at what's happening 
to investment relative, say, to last year. Uh, you could, using a simple example of that, if you think about, you know, lead poisoning that we saw in Michigan a few years ago, uh, you could imagine somebody saying, well, we, you know, measured the height of the children in the area, you know, two years ago, and we measured them again today, and they, they grew by two inches on average, therefore, you know, the lead poisoning is not a problem because it stunts growth. And of course, everybody would laugh at that kind of argument uh, because what you'd want to do is compare it to what the average growth is of a child that age over a two-year period, which would probably be more like six to eight inches. Okay, but but most of the arguments that we see, the commission's arguments included, and and even some people who oppose net neutrality, uh, is that they're just looking at the two-inch argument rather than the six to eight-inch argument. So the trick with investment analysis is trying to figure out what would have happened absent the rules or absent the, the risk of the rules is, is really what I study. And I don't do that. I, I didn't come up with that idea on my own, really. It was uh, an investment advisor who spoke at one of our conferences who, who said that once uh, Julius Janikowski had dropped the Title II word on the, the scene that the industry had begun to incorporate that prospect into its investment decisions. And you did see the stock market react very negatively uh, to the proposal in 2010. So what I've always studied there is the, the 2010 treatment date. And I think from that point on, really, it was the industry knew that this was going to be a regulated service uh, until something serious happened that, that would make it not regulated under Title II of the Communications Act. So that's the treatment date, and actually even a, a proponents of net neutrality and, and critics of my work have used that uh, treatment date, so I think it's a fairly reasonable one. I've done a lot of work on, on investment over the years using different series, uh, different data series, and it, it's always found to be negative. Um, I've published some work in that area, a couple of papers in that area. I've studied other work that's been done in that area, uh, most of it pretty horrendous. Um, but the uh, work that was eventually published was what the FCC relied on the 2018 order. Uh, another piece of uh, work that was uh, it was used at the time and actually mentioned in the court's decision on the 2018 order was the work by the uh, Internet Association, I think, uh, by Chris Hooten. Um, that work was uh, shockingly bad. Um, the data was corrupted. Much of the data was made up, literally, not figuratively. It was literally made up. Um, and even after that was exposed, um, the advocates for net neutrality continued to push that. And that to me is shocking. I mean, to take to take a study of made up data and corrupted data to the court is 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 shocking, really. Uh, very disappointing. But anyway, the question has arisen again, and we've had this flip-flopping back and forth between Title I, Title II. To me, as an economist, I don't think the flip-flopping is very important um, after the first event, really. Um, the industry knows that Title II is a, a, a hotly contested election away every four years. Um, it is a perfect determinant of whether you be Title I or Title II. So you don't respond uh, to the 2018 order, really, because you know that come November of 2020, you, the thing, the whole thing could be turned upside down and you'd be right back where you were. And that's exactly what we've seen. Once a Democrat majority was secured at the commission, uh, the NPRM came out, obviously they've been writing it for months 
And, you know, it was 43 days, I think, after um, Ana Gomez was confirmed that the NPR came out. All three Democrats have said before a drop of evidence was given to the record that they would vote for Title II regulation. So, I mean, there's no appearance of impartiality here. There's no question about where this is going. Um, it's uh, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen sooner rather than later because there's some deadlines that the commission has to, to satisfy. What I've recently done, paper released today, was to look at the U.S. telecom data and, and see what it says about the investment effects of Title II. I'll combine that with some government data on investment in other industries, uh, conduct a fairly standard uh, statistical analysis, econometric analysis of the data. And like before, I found sizable effects, about 10% reduction in, or not reduction, a 10% loss of investment relative to the counterfactual. If you look at investment, it's in telecom, it's fairly stable over much of the period from 2003 to, to, 2000, to 2000, which is the period I looked at. Um, but we were coming out of recession about 2009 and investment in nearly every other industry, I think more than 80% of industries uh, had strongly positive investment trends as we came out of a recession. And so the, the counterfactual investment is positive after that time and telecom investment is uh, stable, I'm growing. Um, so you get this spread between what, what it would be had it followed the pattern of investment that it, it, it uh, followed prior to 20, 2011, basically. Um, so you, you find a set of industries that have the same pattern of investment over time as the telecom industry, and then you see how that tracks out past the 2010 day. Everybody else, well, not everybody, but on average, it's going up uh, significantly in the telecom industry is flat. So the results show about a 10% uh, decline in investment. And this is, you know, investment in broadband networks. Uh, some of the earlier work included investment from broadcasting and things because you couldn't separate the separate the telecom from from the uh, from the broadcasting and, and probably other uh, groups that are included in there, even though almost all the investment comes from telecommunications firms who invest more than any other industry in the nation. Um, so you see a 10% decline in investment and that has a significant effect. That's about $8 billion a year in lost investment, uh, which is significant, 80, 81 billion, 82 billion over 10 years, uh, which is about twice the amount of money allocated by the IAJA for uh, broadband subsidies. So it's a big, big number, but a 10% reduction is not, uh, you know, crazy. Nobody's arguing that, that investment's going to fall by 50%. You know, it's just going to fall by by some as, as you look at the margins of your business at the lower return um, operations and say, well, it doesn't make sense to do that anymore. And you might stop investing in in certain kinds of intellectual property or certain types of network and redirect that to, uh, to other kinds of investments. And take your investment outside the U.S., which happened a lot during the uh, abundant years. So that's the, the story. You lose, if you take estimates of job losses, um, I think I had, you know, about 80,000 jobs lost in the information sector and a couple hundred thousand jobs lost in the economy broadly um, based on some other empirical evidence that I also found the same thing in uh, earlier work on what happened to telecommunications employment after the 2010 uh, Title II announcement. And you can also track this through to, and that, that loss of jobs is, you know, like nearly $20 billion of, of, uh, of income, labor income, so it's pretty significant. And then you can track it to GDP, which is tricky, but I use the standard uh, production model that's been used frequently to analyze the effects of, of telecom investment on 
GDP and, and find the effects to be sizable, about 145 billion in GDP as the telecom sector spreads into into other sectors as a general purpose technology. So the effects are large, um, not too large, but large. Um, and I think I think the, the results are plausible. Um, I looked at it in a few ways, uh, statistically, and and um, I think I think it's pretty strong. It's something something happened around 2010 in the telecom sector that didn't happen elsewhere. And um, there's one pretty clear thing you can point to that that and the companies themselves had, had said that these kind of regulations would uh, interfere with their um, investment choices. The other thing that we did in the paper was look at the virtual circle argument, uh, virtual circle, virtual cycle. The commission uses both, um, which is sort of the, I don't want to call it theoretical, but it's the framework in which the commission contemplates this. And it's basically an argument that the, the edge of the network and the core of the network were strong complements. Um, and this creates a virtuous circle where good things happen to the edge and then good things happen to the core and round and round and round we go. Um, what the commission has failed to do ever is to explain why within this virtuous circle that regulation is required and what, what part of virtue requires regulation. Um, and so we looked at it, taking the commission at its word, and we don't find any reason for the uh, broadband providers to provide some sort of non-neutral treatment of traffic. I mean, if the two are strong complements, then the the health of the edge is uh, important uh, to the, the, the profits of the core. So that argument, virtuous circle argument, doesn't support the intervention. Um, but it does point to to a potential problem with net neutrality, and I think it's fairly obvious the investment effects have got to be non-positive um, and most likely negative, if not decidedly negative. I mean, there's nothing about what the commission is doing under Title II that makes being a broadband provider better. Um, they certainly oppose it, um, and there's no reason why this would would increase their profits and, and certainly reasons why it would decrease their profits uh, or, or just increase the risk of being in the business, the prospect of reduced profits when you hand that kind of power to partisan regulators who don't appear to have any bounds on what they're willing to do to suit some political objective. So that's really where this comes from, I think, is the, um, is the great risk that the regulation proposes more so than necessarily exactly what it stops because there's nothing for it to stop at the moment. And I think every commissioner has acknowledged that there is no justification for this based on behavior. It's, uh, and they use the term guardrail, which is basically to say, nobody's doing anything, but we're afraid they might, even though they never have. Um, even in the few cases where they have, Madison River, and the, and the peer-to-peer uh, -peer situation, those are those are very unique circumstances that people are not really paying attention to the underlying incentives of that. The Madison River case was a rebellion against the commission's proposal to arbitrage access charges. I mean, it's plain and simple. It's the same reason the phone company sabotaged, you know, phones being connected to its network. You only get that kind of behavior when there's regulation. The FCC has, on the one hand, a plan that says really high access charges are going to subsidize rural networks. And then on the other hand, it says, oh, well, by the way, if you run it through this machine, you don't have to pay any access charges. Well, that's a reg that's a response to poorly designed regulation um, or, or a regulatory arbitrage situation in implemented by the regulator. Um, and, and as Larry mentioned, the peer-to-peer -peer case was was the um, the technology had overridden the safety protocols of uh, the congestion protocols of the internet, and were congesting circuits. 
and Comcast wasn't doing it to protect himself. This is what their engineers said at one of our conferences. They did it because it was interfering with other people's services, services that competed with their services. Uh, phone, phone, uh, phone, the VoIP service uh, provided by AT and T. So those two cases are not are not evidence of the company's behavior, uh, you know, or decision to engage in some kind of anti-competitive behavior. Um, and, and there's been nothing, nothing since. I mean, I was reading a document, I think it was by Public Knowledge the other day about what's happened, and it's just almost laughable uh, what they can come up with. So I don't don't see real any reason um, to reimpose this kind of regulation, uh, but I do see that it will be uh, yeah, implemented. And the consequences, I don't know. I think the consequences of, of the new one will be worse than in the past. It's including more sections of Title II, 214 in particular, which is a mother may I invest uh, portion of the statute. Uh, I can't imagine how that's going to happen. I mean, I, I've done some of those back in the day, and that's a mess. Um, and it, it also has disproportionate effects on smaller providers. So I think that's bad. And then you mix it in with the general general regulatory climate, which is pretty bad right now. I mean, you've got this aggressive, unnecessarily aggressive and adversarial digital discrimination uh, rules that are going to solve a problem which doesn't exist. Um, and I'm sure there'll be many other uh, aggressive regulatory things. But you put all those together, and that just makes it really unpleasant uh, to invest capital and in this industry, and it, and it was it can drive up the cost of capital. And investors are not going to pour money into an industry that's being treated the way the current FCC is treating them. Um, it's not just a broadband provider saying, "Oh, I'm not going to invest," or "I am going to invest." They have to go get the money from somebody, and those people uh, may look at the industry as being too risky. So um, that's the story. We would expect a negative effect. We find it. You know, I expect somebody will say it's not there, but it just completely ignores the evidence. They never provide any counter evidence to suggest that it didn't. It's not negative. And even if they did, it'd be better if it wasn't done with made up and corrupted data. Um, but finding nothing is is pretty easy. I mean, that just requires a bad econometric model. Um, but if you if you look at it, I think in a sensible way there are other ways to do it um but if you look at it in a modern you know empirical approach manner and use what data is available there's something there something happened and it's uh it's not a small effect thanks george I, i'm so glad you brought up madison river i knew i'd forgotten something it's like good lord like blast from the past like that in the Pulver order, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Too old, Larry. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure everybody's going, what are they talking about? The hell are they talking All right. About? In the five minutes I got left, let, let me ask you this one thing, because it, this hit me sort of as I walk in the dog this morning. After, again, we've done so much of it. It's been like 20 years. I, I just keep remembering stuff that I'd forgotten about. One thing I think, and this goes to something that you've done a lot of work on. Okay, so the FCC is going to bring back 706 as an affirmative uh, source of authority, okay, um, from being, and, and Najid had reclassified it as 429, they're going to bring it back as firm of source of authority. And again, in order to trigger Section 706, um, you have to show that broadband is not being deployed on a reasonable and timely basis, which gets to a, you know, the easy way of doing it is just keep, re keep, keep jacking up the speeds and you'll never get, you know, you'll never get to that. But we did a paper, what was it, like 15 years ago, where we talked about define timely and also define reasonable. And you remember we were saying something about like, you know, is $50,000 a home? And you start seeing what people are doing with, with the bead money was, you know, out in Alaska. Is that reasonable? And I think nobody's also making that argument, which to me is sort of a fascinating thing. I was wondering if you had a sort of a comment about that. And then also the the other thing about 706, and I'm reminding five moments, this is another paper we did years ago. Turns out that 706 gives co-equal jurisdiction to states and to the feds. 
And what would happen if, say, the state of Alabama decided to say, you know, I want to do a deregulatory thing. Yeah. Nobody's ever challenged that. I think it's an interesting point. But go back right. to, the, to the reasonable and timely, because you've done so much work on what is enough, what is reasonable, what are broadband speeds. And if you can just give a quick comment on that, like, are we is the FCC playing games with the triggering uh, precedent to invoking 706? Well, the FCC will play games. That's that's guaranteed. I'm shocked. It, it is an interesting question and something I've been wanting to study. I mean, the reasonable and timely kind of has two components to it, I think. One is what is reasonably and timely for private actors to do, which is not 100 percent coverage. Obviously, we subsidize broadband billions of dollars and then what is reasonably and timely from a public perspective and that the public's perspective is uh, revealed in the amount of subsidy dollars the government is willing to allocate it might be tricky in in the this this time around to invoke 706 when the government has said i'm giving you 42 billion dollars really it's I think it's more like $300 billion in various forms um, to guarantee everybody has access. Well, now you've got the private sector who's done 92, 3% of it. The government is now saying, well, I'm going to do the rest of it. So it seems almost by definition that, that it's reasonable and timely. Um, but <laughs> You know, it, it could be an interesting question how they wiggle the way out of that because it's, it's you know, what's what has not been done by the private sector has been, money has been allocated to, by the public sector to accomplish that. So we have accomplished the goal um, or, or at least had the funding to accomplish the goal. It'll take a few years because, you know, there's a shortage of labor and sometimes equipment. But um, that's an interesting it's an interesting question. I'll have to think about how that how how that might play out in the future. But that could be a serious problem. I mean, it's a serious problem anyway. When you, when your own data shows that that well over ninety percent of people have a hundred uh, megabits of service or better, um, and you've got a, a satellite network capable of of delivering pretty close to that anywhere on the planet, um, how do you make the argument it's not deployed? Um, particularly under the current standard of 25.3, I mean, that's probably going to change, but even at 120, almost everybody has it, you know, except for these extremely costly rural areas and, and places, you know, tribal areas and has their own unique disadvantages. And and then, you know, bu bu buildings, you know, multi-dwelling units that you can't get access to. In some cases, governments interfere, local governments interfere with the... Uh, the upgrading service so i mean it's it's hard to argue that it's not reasonably deployed when nearly everybody has really good broadband service all right well thank you very much everybody i've noticed we we've actually made it to the hour um and thank you very much for bearing with george and myself again all of our research is available on our webpage www.phoenix-center.org I'd like to thank George Ford. I'd like to thank Emily and the FedSoc for, for hosting us. Hope everybody had a good time. Feel free to reach out to everybody if you have questions. And Emily, I will turn it back to you. Thank you very much, everybody. On behalf of the Federalist Society, thank you both for joining us for this great discussion today. And thank you also to our audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. Check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned.